This one um, is about a um, four-year-old boy who uh, has been having recurrent upper respiratory infections. You see them in the office, and um, you diagnose him with the fourth otitis and sinusitis case um, that he's had in the last um, six months. Well, at the last visit, you did that. This is a new visit that you're having. So about this family, this family moved from Maryland to Pennsylvania because the father thought that perhaps he could find a job with the industry. He found he secured a job at a kind of a water withdrawal station. And when they moved, they, um, their house kind of abuts um, the compressor station. The um, mother reports that when she's crossing the yard, um, she sometimes has kind of a funny taste on her mouth. Um, and the father says that he smokes, but he only does that outside the house. And when you ask about kind of the past medical history for the child, um, it was kind of like a you know, normal pregnancy, normal birth. And um, he did not really have these recurrent respiratory infections prior to moving here. The issue, the, the whole point here is to kind of become familiar with how to incorporate taking an environmental history into your um, you know, routine medical history. When you see the child, the child is very pay playful. He's afebrile. He, you know, charts well on the growth chart. Um, and then on the, um, you know, ear, nose, and throat, normal tympanic membranes, he just has some nasal crusting. And then maybe some kind of like crackly upper airway sounds, you know, that are just being transmitted. Um, now, we kind of using this case to demonstrate, to talk about why are children not small adults? So yes, yeah, so they definitely have um, that increased respiratory rate. So then, so, so per you know, like cubic centimeter of air, they take in more, um, uh, the, they take in more toxins than adult. They play very vigorously. They play outside a lot more. They might not have the same kind of like understanding of you know environmental hazards and be cautious about them as adults do. They, at their different developmental stages, they might demonstrate different behaviors. So one of the things that we always talk about is the mouthing behavior, you know, in, like in relation to lead and things like that. They're, so they're kind of, their filtering organs like kidneys and livers are not as well developed in terms of you know, doing that. And then their kind of their body surface ratio to their body mass is um, a lot more. Okay, so what about this compressor station? Compressor stations, um, they, what, we know that they, there's a lot of fugitive emissions from various different point sources in the kind of the, uh, in the chain of um, um, these different sources that are along the um, uh, uh, natural, na natural gas uh, um, operations. And so one, w some of the things that they emit are um, these kind of combustion products and volatile organic compounds. They, in a lot, some of the other um, parts of the country where um, hydraulic fracturing occurs, like in Texas, for example, they have been documented to show that they kind of degrade the air quality. The, what happens, in, as um, Dr. Wally pointed out, uh, kind of alluded to a little bit, is that you have the, 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 um, the nitrogen oxide uh, compounds plus the volatile organic compounds, and then uh, in the presence of, you know, sunlight, they... Um, create what's ground, called ground level ozone, right? And ozone up there is good, down here is bad. Um, they, because they essentially kind of, it goes straight for your, you know, pulmonary tissue, makes it very br brittle, and that's irreversible. So that's why it's, you know, linked to the kind of, for example, premature death, um, especially in urban settings, you know, in um, the elderly population, um, and, you know, impact, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 young athletes, you know, who, uh, who might be playing in, um, in football fields close to uh, these uh, compressor stations, like, for example, as it is in um, Dallas and Fort Worth. Um, so they exacerbate underlying pulmonary conditions like um, asthma and COPD. And then the other component of um, air pollution, which is sometimes what we know as smog, right, it's particulate matter plus ground level ozone, is that, um, you know, we used to kind of look at particular matter as, you know, 10, then 5, then 2.5, and then we hear about 0.5 today, which is this kind of like very, very ultra-fine um, uh, particular matter that, you know, heads straight for the uh, kind of the, the, the um, you know, end of your air sacs, so bronchioles and then alveoli. And then, so in addition to doing that, the um, P2 
PM2.5 also absorbs other um, um, hazardous compounds like polyaromatic um, hydrocarbons, and then it creates kind of an inflammatory response, and in general, they're um, connected to, they're, they're thought of as possible um, lung carcinogens. Um, this is um, taken from um, a presentation that was done by Earthworks and um, Dr. Subra, and I just kind of put it there just to kind of point out the various different point sources that could be along this chain, you know, of, uh, of what might be involved in a natural gas operation, especially um, at a compressor, compressor, compressor station. And I don't know what their end was, but they said that 90% of individuals experience odor events from these facilities. And then um, these are some of the examples that have been detected um, in um, some of the chemicals that have been detected in the air, mainly um, volatile organic compounds and then sulfur dioxide. So this family did have a, um, a, an air test done from their, in their backyard, you know, close to the um, compressor station. And just ignore that right side, that right column, and then just look at the middle column. You might, so, so, much, so for example, just here's kind of what families do, right? This test gets done, they get, you know, this result, and then they'll see that, for example, for, um, you know, uh, Freon 11, the, the um, sample is 0.26, but the detection limit is 0.05, and that's very worrisome. You know, this is a lot higher than the detection limit is. This was done by a SUMA canister. And then I'm going to go into the different ones as well. Um, so then they look at that and they think that that's very worrisome. However, in this scenario, this actually is a laboratory contaminant. Um, and this happens with air testing quite frequently. So to me, actually, air testing is a lot more complicated than, air, than water testing. Um, there's a few different reasons for that. One is that you know, for water, you know, we had that whole table of the maximum contaminant levels that EPA had put out. But really, there's only like six things that go into the, the national ambient air quality standards, right, that they test for. So then what, what are all these other things? There's really kind of, um, uh, you, it, it's really important to work with people who know about air testing to be able to kind of interpret these things. You know, an industrial hygienist, for example who would know about air testing, you know, or just um, other folks who are very familiar with this, to be able to kind of reduce, I would think, unnecessary anxiety in people. The reason we know that this is a laboratory contaminant is because generally they also send a blank sample, and so if this shows up in the blank sample, then you know that it was a laboratory contaminant and not in the air. Do I want to say something else? Anyway, it's all in your answer. What are the different, um, so what are some of the things that can happen with air testing? There's different types of, you know, whereas, you know, with water, you just take one sample and you can say, oh, can you also test with, with air, you have to have the right, you know, um, 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 monitor to be doing that particular test for that particular um, 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 you know, air contaminant. So you could have a SUMA canister, which is a 24-hour SUMA canister you put it in somebody's yard. However, the point, with sumic canisters, you, check, you can't check for methane. Um, you could have um, a, um, an H2S monitor, and you can have that as part of, as kind of like a spot test or as a 24-hour um, um, monitor. You could also wear personal air monitors, which, you know, this is, that's how they did the, the NIAR study, right, with the silica. Um, the direction of the wind matters, the weather pattern, for example, where, um, where it was raining that day, where you're standing, upwind or downwind, the location that you sampled it, and then again, you know, sample contamination. So one thing that happened is that, um, you know, you could, the types of, like, in, like with water, contamination can stay there, and you can, you know, check it, and you might be able to catch it. However, with air, a plume is a lot more transient. It can be gone by the time you go to test it. So um, that's why, you know, it's really important to um, kind of like do it as close to the odor event as possible and, again, work with people and, you know, do the right test. The other um, components of the air pollution is, you know, the, the diesel truck traffic. We talked about that. Um, flaring is a huge issue, and um, Dr. Wally talked about that. I also heard recently that because of the 
drop in the water levels. Um, they are, we're talking about flaring flow back to get water to, for, um, for refracting stages. Then um, hydrogen sulfide. And then you could also be in areas where there's already pre-existing air pollution, like in coal country, you know, like where we are now, I suppose. So what would be our recommendation for this family with the four-year-old? Um, we might recommend that they have an air filter in his room um, so that, you know, to, to be going on at night so that at least, you know, his air is filtered um, while he's sleeping. You want to avoid ionizers, and there's something in your toolkit about, you know, how to pick an air filter. You want to monitor for signs of asthma. Um, you want to ask the father not to smoke at all because, again, you know, it doesn't matter that he smokes outside. And then also, um, you know, like if, if, if they're, you know, working, if the father's working with, you know, dust or anything like that, they might want to change their attire before coming in because, you know, that was kind of a very similar scenario with asbestosis, you know, and workers and how the family members of, you know, asbestosis workers were getting exposed. Okay. That's it.